Hey, before we get into the teaching today, just two things I want to uh, call to your attention. As uh, Sarah told you uh, so well, we start brand new, uh, or we started a teaching series last week called Manger Things. Uh, this is our social media. If you want to find us on social media, just, just look for My Miami Valley. Find My Miami, search My Miami Valley. Our social media will come up. You'll find this graphic that you can just share. You can cut it. You can paste it. Uh, that gives Christmas Eve Eve, December 23rd, 4 p.m., 7 p.m., like Sarah told you, and then two weeks from today, Christmas Eve day, uh, service at, at 4 p.m. Uh, our team has put the finishing touches on that service. You are in for some incredibly uh, wonderful surprises that night, and we hope that you'll come. Our team is excited. Uh, rehearsals are beginning, and so we just want you uh, to uh, be a part of that, uh, and we want you to be able to to invite. Uh, by the way, can I, can I just say a word to those of you? If you're watching uh, on social media, you're watching on Facebook Live, you're watching us later in the week, uh, it would really help us out if you would respond so that we can know. Uh, like if you're watching on Facebook Live and you're watching with three others, if you just let us know, hey, four of us are watching, uh, and we'd prefer that you'd like it as long as you do, you know, thumbs up, some kind of smiley face, something like that. But, but uh, just let us know that you're watching. Uh, that would really help us out, so we would appreciate that. Um, uh, so, so we want to encourage you to invite. It's really easy this time of year to invite. I have a habit every uh, Sunday. I get up ridiculously early. Uh, I spend time in prayer, uh, in my study at home, uh, going over, uh, thinking, praying, uh, and getting ready. I, I leave the house, and, and I stop at the local McDonald's, and there's a booth back there that you know, should have a plaque with my name on it. But uh, I stop in, I just kind of sit and think. And this morning I got to the local McDonald's and you would have thought that the world was coming to an end. Uh, there's a group of men that meets there every morning, and especially every Sunday morning, and, uh, and two women. Uh, I didn't see any of the women there this morning. And so uh, they, they, they meet and um, this morning you would have thought the world was coming to an end because there were signs on the McDonald's that said, uh, today at 11 o'clock our McDonald's closes for renovations. Public service announcement from me to you. Don't go to McDonald's for lunch today, at least not this one. Uh, and, and these men were starting to talk about, what are we going to do? Where are we going to meet? Where are we going to meet next Sunday? At which point, I simply pulled out my handy pack of invite cards and said, I have a table for you next Sunday morning. Why don't you come meet with us? It's so easy. Friends, here's what I want to say. Grab some of these invite cards. They have uh, the major things graphic. They have invitation times. It's really easy. It's almost impossible to go through a day without having an opportunity to. You have to try really hard not to invite somebody because people are talking about spiritual things. Very easy to do, so please make sure to pick up some of these invite cards uh, and invite uh, to Christmas Eve uh, services. Uh, here's our promise. Everybody that you invite will be entertained, but everybody that you invite will have the opportunity to hear the gospel clearly proclaimed and have an invitation to respond. We're doing it, a major thing is kind of a takeoff, like Sarah said, off the Netflix hit show, uh, Stranger Things. But here's the reality, folks. Here's what we're going to do on Christmas Eve. Uh, they stole our story. They simply stole our story. Uh, uh, they're retelling the gospel, and, and, and they've taken some liberties with it, by the way. But they're just simply retelling the gospel story. And we're going to point that out, how the gospel is seen in the whole Netflix series, Stranger Things. And I want you to invite your friends. Maybe they'll hear about Christmas in a way that they've never heard. Second thing, uh, very quickly, uh, end of the year offering. You see these green, green envelopes there in front of you every year. Uh, we take an end of the year offering. Just ask you to prayerfully consider what God would have you give to the church at the end of the year. Uh, this year, uh, we don't have anything that we need to catch up on. So all $40,000 or whatever is raised, every penny that's raised through the Christmas offering, end of the year offering this year, will be spent outside the walls of this church uh, in missions, in ministry, in evangelism. And, and so here, we need your help to gain some momentum at Christmas and keep that momentum going uh, because in February we're sending a mission, we're being part of a mission that's going to South Asia. In March we're part of a mission that's going to Nicaragua. And Easter is the first day of the second quarter, April 1st. That's no joke. Nothing, nothing. I thought I'd try. Uh, Easter, is, Easter is April 1st, and so uh, those 90 days of the, of the, of the new year are going to hit, uh, and this $40,000 will help us really get a jump start to ministry outside the walls of this church. So please prayerfully consider uh, what you're going to give. Uh, week two, major things. Uh, the title of today's teaching is simply called Ponder Anew. Uh, some of you are like, I grew up in church, I know that hymn. That phrase is ponder anew what the Almighty can do. Uh, that's what I want to ask you to do. We, we've seen from Mary's example last week that 
Well, everybody wondered. They, they, they were marveled for a minute. Mary meditated for a lifetime. That She began to process these things. And, and the part of the story in Luke 1 that we pick up today as we tell the story of, of, of Christmas again, uh, everything's building to this moment. Hundreds and thousands of years, people have been waiting, building to this moment. I, I want you to begin to ponder anew this story by reviewing the story with me through this video. As this video is playing, uh, find out how many of these Bible stories you can identify. The angel in the sixth month is going to appear to Mary and say, uh, Hail, thou favored one, the Lord is with you. And Mary's going to be confused and she's going to be startled and she's, she's, she's going to be afraid. And the angel's going to say, Do not be afraid. But as she begins to think through these things, uh, Mary understands that maybe this is the moment for hundreds and thousands of years. This story that begins in a garden has been moving towards this, waiting for God's promise. People have been saying, come thou long expected Messiah, we cannot wait, we cannot wait. Maybe this is the moment. And all of the stories that begin uh, to happen in the scriptures find in them Jesus and they point to this moment and it's, it's critical that we understand and that we read this. If you brought a Bible, we're gonna be hanging out in Luke chapter one this morning. Luke chapter one, as we look at this story in a little bit different way, this story that doesn't just have implications for earth, it has implications for heaven. Glory to the highest, in the highest heaven and on earth, peace. Glory there, peace here, glory there. There's cosmic nature to this amazing story. And so question for you as we get going today. Have you ever had a moment in your life something happened, maybe a series of something's happened, and you, you reach the conclusion that um, this is not how I thought my life was going to turn out. 
I just didn't see it playing out this way. Um, whatever it might be, you, you, you thought that between there and here, a whole lot of other things, and now I'm here, and I just don't know how that could be. What do you do when, when life doesn't turn out exactly the way that you thought it would be? It even happens in Stranger Things. As we begin to be introduced to this sleepy little town called Hawkins, we, we, we begin to, uh, to, to understand that there's stuff underneath the surface and, and things aren't the way they're supposed to be uh, before Will is taken. His mother, Joyce, is a single mom on the edge of just breakdown. We're introduced to Hopper and we see him in a welter of prescription uh, bottles and beer cans and life's not supposed to be like that. And as we begin to know his story, there's a box with the name Sarah on it and oh my goodness, uh, there's tragedy about that. That's not supposed to happen to a little girl. As you, as you watch the, the, the children in the story, you, you, you see Jonathan and you see, man, you look into his eyes and you're like, there's a kid who's got uh, too old too soon. And you watch Lucas and he talks about Nam way too much with way too frequency and with way too much knowledge about what happened in that terrible place. And he has no sense. And even the, the house of, of, of Mary and uh, uh, Mike and Nancy that, that bring you uh, just a sense of, hey, there's a little bit of brightness and coziness. Uh, even that house is disrupted when you see a couple of parents who are always snarky at each other if they're not ignoring one another. And you understand that underneath the surface, things aren't the way they're supposed to be in this town, not just at the lab, but all across town. Have you ever reached a moment in your life where you say, this is not how I thought life was going to, this is not how life was supposed to to be. A few years ago, uh, we had uh, some friends that were out searching for their first house. They both work, and they had plenty of money, and they had discovered a house that they wanted, their dream house, and it cost them around $300,000. When it came opportunity to begin to refinance, uh, they had appraisals done, and the highest appraisal that existed on this house that they'd been in less than five years was now $180,000. And I got a hunch. When they were out house shopping, that's not how they thought it would turn out that this investment would have lost them $120,000. Have you ever had a moment when you go through something like, this is not how we thought this was supposed to be? Our middle daughter, Carissa, had made a very good friend in college. Her name is Allie. She brought Allie to our house. We got to celebrate Easter with Allie one year, and we just found out that this past Thursday, Allie's 19-year-old sister was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, bone cancer. That's not how that's supposed to happen. Uh, when we were in Pennsylvania, Autumn taught piano lessons, and she taught to a brother and sister, and we have kept in touch with that family ever since we've been away. And uh, a few years ago, we got invited to the, to the girl, uh, to, the, to the daughter's wedding, and it was beautiful down in Louisville, and we had just an amazing time in celebrating with that family. And three months later, she's having open-heart surgery. And I got a hunch, her groom of three months never said, I imagine that's what we're going to be doing three months from now. What do you do in those moments when life just doesn't turn out the way you think it should be? It's even more frustrating if you've done everything you think God's asked you to do. So this Christmas story that begins, most of the time we jump in about Luke chapter 1, verse 26, that says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary in the town of Nazareth. The sixth month of what? Uh, there's another thing going on. There's another story that we have to understand. Luke chapter 1, uh, beginning in verses 5, 6, and 7. Just, just listen to this. I, I need you to see that there's another story. There's another couple. Life didn't turn out how they had expected in the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah. What is he? He's a priest. He works for God. He belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Check this out. That means she came from a priestly family as well. They had a background of families who taught them to love God, to serve God, to worship God. That was their background. That's how they grew up, all right? Religious. That's not enough. Verse 6 says, both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Despite what people had to say about their ancestry that, that made them righteous, in God's eyes they were righteous, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Wow. 
all of his commands, all of his decrees, without fault, blameless. God looks at them and says, you, you want an example of how to live? Look at those two, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Verse 9, but. Uh-oh, but what? But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. In that culture, marriage happens to a young man's in his early 20s, the young lady's still a teenager. And I imagined on their wedding day, they didn't stand and say, 50 years from now, we won't have any children. No. In that culture, more than in our culture, having a child was a, was a sign of the favor of God resting on you. And, and if you didn't have a child, maybe it was because there was something wrong between you and God. But we've already been told, no, 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 nothing wrong between them and God. They observed all of God's commands and decrees blamelessly. Uh, can you imagine the picture in that little community where they grew up? In the early days after Elizabeth hasn't had a child. Oh, honey, the, the ladies of the, the community, the ladies of the village come, oh, honey, it's okay. You're still young. You still have plenty of time. There's plenty of time. Fast forward 10 years now, maybe 10, 15 years now, she's in her 30s, and the, the ladies aren't as sweet now. They're like, honey, you need to figure this out. And they give her all kinds of herbal home remedies. And she does them all. And oh yeah, three villages over, there's a doctor who specializes in fertility. Go see him. And she does everything and still no baby. And another decade, and another decade, and another decade. And the people look at them with disgrace and say, there's something wrong with you or Zechariah 1 are hiding something from God. There's some sin in your life and they are the cause of shame and disgrace. I would submit to you, these two people did not expect life to turn out this way. Here's what I'd say about Zechariah and Elizabeth. They are deeply devoted and they are deeply disappointed. Do you know the feeling? Doing everything you think God's asked you to do, deeply devoted. Obeying God the best you know how, living life and in front of God and doing exactly, deeply devoted, but at the same time, deeply disappointed. Just because you're deeply devoted and faithful to God doesn't mean nothing bad's going to happen in your life. Doesn't mean that you're not going to get to a point in your life where like, I didn't expect this. I've been faithful all along. What we usually do when we've been faithful, like, God, how could you do this to me? I've been faithful all along. Well, God doesn't promise that he's going to do certain things for you. They are deeply devoted and deeply disappointed all at once. Do you, do you know the feeling? Uh, the story continues that Zechariah, his, his uh, turn comes up to go minister in the temple and he goes to offer sacrifices and offer prayers and lights fire and smoke blows up. And as the smoke's coming up, uh, People are praying, oh good, our, our prayers are getting offered to God, but oh no, Zechariah is the one praying. <laughs> are they really going to get there? Something must be up because he doesn't even have a kid. Can, can we trust even his, his prayer life? But he continues to be faithful. And while he's doing his uh, priestly uh, duty in the temple, the angel appears to them. Gabriel shows up and says, Zechariah, I just want you to know Elizabeth's going to conceive and, and have a child. And he's shocked. Like, how can it be? She's past childbearing years. And all of a sudden, the angel says, because you didn't believe the word of the Lord, here's what's going to happen to you. You're not going to be able to talk for the next nine months. And so he comes out of the temple and knows that he's going to have a baby, and he can't tell anybody. And Elizabeth becomes pregnant, and the scriptures say that Elizabeth went into seclusion for five months. And Zechariah and Elizabeth are trying to figure this thing out And that's when the story says in the sixth month, in the sixth month of what? In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel is sent from Jerusalem to Nazareth. He has a little more work to do. But before we get there, I'm just curious Uh, Elizabeth says this, verse 25, she said, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. See that? The people looked at her with disgrace. Uh, Something's up between you and God. That's the only reason you're not having a child. And Elizabeth, best we know, there's nothing between us and God. Best we know we're living exactly how he wanted. He's just not chosen to give us children. And now all of a sudden she's, she's five months pregnant. And she says that God's taken away the disgrace of the people and he's shown me favor. Uh, Here's what I want to share with you today. When you're deeply devoted and deeply disappointed, uh, there is a heavenly father who likes to shower his favor in unexpected times and unlikely places on unsuspecting people. Did you catch it? 
unexpected times, in unlikely places, and on unsuspecting people. God likes to shower his favor. I don't know about you, but I like to have a little of that favor in my life, even when I'm deeply devoted and deeply disappointed. It's what your heavenly father does. You're looking at me today and some of you are like, good grief, Tim, you look a little bit more tired than normal. That is very true. From uh, Friday morning at 6 o'clock to last night, uh, Saturday night at 6 o'clock, uh, Autumn and I uh, drove a round trip total of a little over 900 miles to spend just a little over 10 hours uh, with our youngest daughter who is away at college. I don't know how it worked in your family, but I think when our three daughters decided to go to college, they drew a radius of how far away it was that mom and dad just couldn't pop in for the weekend. (laughs) We want to go there. And so our our youngest daughter uh, next year will be serving uh, an internship with an international missions organization. uh, And at the university on Friday night, Uh, they had a commissioning service for the 30 students who are going to be going out serving. Um, Six, seven weeks ago, Annalise called us and said, hey, mom and dad, uh, this thing's coming up, and I know you can't come, and I don't expect you to be there. Uh, But our professors in the Global Studies Department (laughs) told us all we had to tell our parents that this was happening because they're sick and tired of getting emails uh, the next week when parents say, how come you didn't tell us this was going on? And so I'm just telling you, don't expect you to come, at which point I start to do this kind of thing in my mind. She's like, Dad, I know you're teaching. That's too far to come on a Friday night. I know Mom works. I know you can't get here. So Autumn and I talked, and we thought, and we prayed about it. like, let's go, but let's make it a surprise. And so we worked with uh, a few of her friends, and we set up this surprise. And so we decided on Friday night uh, before the event at 4.30, we were going to meet at literally this hole in the wall restaurant you literally you go down about six steps through a hole in the wall of the building and you go down another layer and they put us in the very back and so we're in the back room uh, and Annalise doesn't know it and so let me show you a couple of pictures Uh, Annalise if you don't know she's our daughter uh, on the our youngest daughter she's on the left Uh, she rounds the corner and she uh, I I apologize that these are a little blurry they they're a screenshot from the video I took um, she comes around the wall, the corner, and she sees her mom, and she begins to weep, and she's wiping away tears from her eyes. She's going to drop her uh, wallet, and she's going to drop her keys on the floor, and she's going to get to her mama as fast as she can, and she begins to embrace. By the way, you can see a couple of her friends in the background. Uh, one of them is like, uh, you need to re- be really proud of me. I suck at lying, and so that I could hold this in for a secret for a week was a really good thing. And then just one more picture Uh, Annalise still trying to process uh, what's going on because um, she saw some folks who sprinkled a little bit of favor on her uh, in an unexpected place, in an unlikely place at an unexpected time on an unsuspecting daughter. And friends, nothing special about Autumn and I, but I just submit to you that's what your heavenly dad wants to do in your life, that he wants to meet you in an unlikely place at an unexpected time when you least expect him to show up and sprinkle just a little bit of favor on you. And Annalise would say over the course of the weekend, I can't believe you come. I didn't expect it. And my simple response was, is what dads do. I wanted to be here. There's no place I would have rather been. There's no way I would have missed this. And God was gracious to give us the opportunity to go. And I just want you to know, this is the Christmas story. That a heavenly dad's going to show up in your life in an unlikely place, at an unexpected time, when you least suspect he's going to show up and he's going to sprinkle a little bit of favor over you, if you'll receive it. Uh, Next thing, here's what I want to invite you to do. Next slide, if you would. Uh, uh, God just gives his favor at unexpected times to unsuspecting people in unlikely places. Uh, As the next picture of the map, Dawn, if we can get the map, uh, Angel Gabriel shows up in Jerusalem. We kind of expect the angels to hang out around Jerusalem because that's where the temple of God is. We don't expect angels to show up in Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. That's the reputation. Nothing good, nothing, nothing ever positive happens in Nazareth. Why would an angel show up in an unlikely place to an unsuspecting teenage girl in an unexpected time and say, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. And Mary is perplexed. And she doesn't know what to do. Here's what I want to invite you to do this Christmas season. As you think about the Christmas, as you ponder the Christmas story. Would you please 
anticipate God's grace and favor in a thousand different ways between now and Christmas. Just expect that's what that's what your dad does. That's what your heavenly dad does. He wants to catch you off guard and shower you with his favor. Anticipate him to show his goodness in a hundred, a thousand different ways. But but we don't we don't like it that way. Here, here's what we want to do. We we want it to make linear sense. Uh, we want everything to work out just as we planned. I'll go on the date because that might mean a relationship and that might result in an engagement. I'll get that degree in college because it will result in that job. I'll get that job in college and I'll work hard and it will result in that promotion. And I'll have the surgery because it will result in my health. And sometimes the date doesn't lead to an engagement and the degree doesn't lead to the career. And working hard in the job doesn't lead to the promotion. And the surgery doesn't result in better health. And sometimes life just isn't the way we thought it would turn out. And we've done everything. We're deeply devoted and we're incredibly disappointed. We've done everything we've known to do. What do you do? I submit to you. Anticipate God's goodness. Anticipate him. to sprinkle a little bit of flavor, a favor on your life in unexpected times and unsuspecting ways in an unlikely place. If Zechariah and Elizabeth are deeply devoted, but deeply disappointed. That's at the back end of their life, right? Uh, They had plans, and nothing's worked out the way it was supposed to. Uh, Mary's a little bit different. Mary's at the start of her relationship with Joseph. She has dreams. She has desires. And now all of a sudden, an angel comes up and says, "Um, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you, and you're going to give birth to a son. I think Mary at the start of this like, That's nothing I had planned for my life. If Zachariah and Elizabeth are deeply devoted and highly disappointed, Mary is uh, highly favored and highly frazzled. (laughs) I I had other plans. I know how I want to get, I know what my marriage is going to look like. I know when I'm going to start to have kids. I I know uh, how Joseph's carpentry business is going to take off. I just know how everything's going to take place. I have plans and I'm looking forward to them. And sometimes it just doesn't work that way. And God shows up in an unlikely place at an unexpected time to grant you some unsuspecting favor. Luke 1, 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. The angel said to her, greetings you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled, verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. It's the same spirit that we saw in Mary after the shepherds came. It says she she pondered in her heart and treasured up all these things in their heart and pondered what they might mean. It's her habit of taking and looking at things and trying to figure them out. And how's God at work in this? It's not what I had planned. I'm, I, I see I'm highly favored, but I'm also kind of highly frazzled. How does this all fit together? And she begins to, to give thought. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you're to call him Jesus. The entire, the entire biblical story has been moving towards this moment with hundreds and thousands of years. People have been waiting in anticipation for the promised Messiah, for God to do what he said he would do. And now in this moment, an angel comes and says, Mary, you're it. The moment happens now. And I think she's a bit frazzled. And she begins to think and she begins to ponder. And I I think these are some of the things she's thinking about. I think she's thinking about Eve. I think Mary knows the biblical story. She knows the story of creation, that God created a man and woman, placed them in the garden of perfection, and said that they were to be fruitful and multiply. God had a relationship with them, and they sinned, and the relationship was broken. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we see the first evidence of the gospel. Theologians call it the proto-evangelion, the, the, the first gospel presentation, and this is it. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, uh, God speaking to the serpent, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel and that's the picture of the gospel there's coming to one a rescuer and a dreamer from the seed of woman that's going to to defeat you i had a friend that sent me this picture earlier this christmas season i just i just been uh captivated by it it's a picture it's supposed to be mary uh, on the right eve on the left the serpent wrapped around her legs <laughs> you see it's under her the head of the serpent's under her heel it's Genesis 3.15. It's the picture of the gospel of what's, what's supposed to happen. I think Mary's thinking about Eve. What, what, am, am I the woman? It is the promised one coming for me. I think, I think Mary's thinking about Eve. I think Mary's thinking about Abraham. 
For thousands, of genera- for thousands of years, people have been waiting for this promise. God said to Abraham, I choose you, and through you the nations of the world will be blessed. If people bless you, uh, they'll be blessed. If they curse you, I'm going to curse them. Through you, Abraham, you are going to be the father of this new nation. And I think Mary's like, oh my goodness, am, am I part of that line now? Is, is, is the promise one, the promise to Abraham finally going to be fulfilled and the son I am going to birth? I think she's thinking about Eve. I think she's thinking about Abraham. I think she's thinking about David. King David who had a desire to build the temple. And because of his lifestyle, God said, no, you cannot build the temple. Your son Solomon's going to build the temple. But God said to him, God gave him this promise, 2 Samuel 7, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Read the story of the, God, of the, of the birth of Jesus. And all along, David, 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 time came uh, for her to give birth. So they uh, traveled to Bethlehem, the city of David. David, 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 it appeared. I think Mary's thinking about David, the, the king who's thrown, oh my goodness, is, is the one who's going to be birthed through me, the fulfillment of this promise. She's thinking about Eve, she's thinking about Abraham, she's thinking about David, and she's like, oh my goodness, the generations that have been waiting are coming to this moment. If you begin to ponder that and you begin to process that, do you not think you'll be more than a bit frazzled? Really, me? How could God use someone like me? And if that's not enough, the angel says, verse 32 of chapter 1, he'll be great and will be called son of the most high God. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary, if you have any doubts, just let me tell you what you're thinking is right. Your son is the one. And Mary's like, time out. I got a problem with that. I am in a pre-sex relationship. (laughs) How's it going to happen? Verse 34 says this, How will this be, Mary said, uh, asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And Mary, I just want you to know, this this is what God does. God uh, works in you and through you to allow you to be more and do more than you could ever do by yourself. And just trust His Word. Just trust His Word. When Zechariah is in in the temple, he's made speechless for nine months because he did not believe the word of God. Mary simply says, may it be done to me according to your word. I'm your servant. May it simply be done to me according to your word. I think that screams, Zechariah and Elizabeth both kind of respond that way uh, about servant. Yeah, and Mary said, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. When Zechariah is finally able to speak, he breaks out in song and he says, uh, God has done this to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness. Last week we talked about two major thing prayers. Prayer one, come on in. Prayer two, send me. Can I give you a major thing's prayer number three this day? God, I'm your servant. God, I'm your servant. I wonder how much our lives would turn upside down if that was our prayer every single day. I wonder how much my day might change if I woke up and before I walked out the door, I simply said, I'm your servant. Some of you will drive to a job tomorrow And you don't want to go because you're already thinking of the people on the other side of that office door that are going to make you roll your eyes. You know who they are. And you're like, I do not want to have to deal with them. And when you start to deal with them, they rub you the wrong way and you start to treat them uh, improperly and you start to have thoughts that you shouldn't have and you're just like, leave me alone. What if tomorrow on your way to work, say, God, I know there's some things waiting for me on the other side of the office door, but I simply want to say, uh, today I'm your servant. When that person starts to annoy me, help me know how to serve them. What if? I know in our church that there's some of you in the midst of relationship struggles. I know of several marriages in the life of our church that hang on by a thread. And often this happens as couples begin to drift apart, as couples begin uh, to move away from one another. Uh, They both take a stance and they both want to demand their rights. Well, I'm right and she's wrong. Well, I'm right and he's wrong. And when they understand that I'm right and they're wrong, things might be able to change. What if? Just what if your Christmas major thing prayer simply was, God, I don't need to be right. I'm simply your servant today. And instead of being right today, God, show me how I can serve my wife. There is power when a man simply says, I will serve my wife and my children today. There is power when a woman says, I do not have to be right. I will simply serve my husband and my children today. What if instead of both demanding your rights, uh, both of you began to serve and simply say, I may not ever get what I want, but I will serve. Ryan, if you'd come on up, that'd be great. 
Concerning this pregnancy, the angel Gabriel gave us something that we skipped over. I skipped over it intentionally. Basically saying, hey, Mary, I want you to know your pregnancy isn't the only one going on now. Chapter 1, verse 36 from Luke. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have, her child, have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Hey, Mary, your relative, Elizabeth. Mary's like, really? I didn't think that was possible. I know how people talk about her. I know how they talk about her and Zechariah. I know that they think they're the disgrace of the town. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look what the angel says next, verse 37. I think that's coming up on the screen. Verse 37 says, And nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing, nothing will be impossible with God. Friend, whatever it is you're facing today, if God's going to come in in an unlikely time, in an unlikely place at an unexpected time and drop some favor on some unsuspected people, he's going to do the miraculous. Nothing you're facing today is impossible. That's the word of God. Nothing will be impossible with God. What's Mary going to do with this information? Who can she talk to? Who's going to believe her that she's, that she's pregnant with God's child? If only there was some, oh wait, her relative Elizabeth. So Mary leaves Nazareth and travels to Jerusalem. And she has a conversation with Elizabeth. Uh, check this out. Mary knows Elizabeth is pregnant. Elizabeth doesn't know Mary's pregnant. Mary shows up, verse 39. Mary got up and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby wept in her, loom, uh, her womb and Elizabeth was filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. How did, Mary know, how did Elizabeth know uh, Mary was pregnant? A baby in the womb told her. Think about that for a bit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Bless are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. Why did she believe the Lord would fulfill the promise to her? Because the angel said, Nothing will be impossible for God. So whether you're on the front of your journey, like Mary, and you know God favors you, but you're still highly frazzled because things aren't looking like they're going to work out like you thought they would, your plan's starting to fall apart, or whether you're towards the end of your journey and you're deep, you've been deeply devoted all of your life and you're still deeply uh, disappointed, I want to encourage you to do one thing. Here's what I want to ask you to do. Keep your message outline open, but if you would, please close your Bible. Elizabeth's reply to Mary kind of gushes out and it's, it's not well rehearsed. Mary's been thinking, Mary's been pondering, and when she speaks, when Elizabeth speaks to her, how, how can this be uh, that this would happen? Uh, Mary sings a song. We preached a whole sermon series on it two years ago. You can go online and you can get it. But I just want you to listen to the words of Mary's song. Listen to the words of Mary's song. It goes like this. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant from now on. All generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. But his mercy, oh, his mercy is for all who will fear him. From generation to generation. He's done powerful deeds with his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their throne, but he has lifted up the humble. He fills the hungry with every good thing. He sends away the rich empty. He has helped his servant Israel by remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. That was her song. What's your song this Christmas season? Deeply devoted, deeply disappointed, highly favored, yet still highly frazzled. What's your song? Do you not have a Christmas song this morning? How come? If you'll take Mary's song and you'll begin to ponder this Christmas season, if you'll ponder anew what the Almighty can do, you're going to think about four things on your teaching outline very quickly. Here they come. Four things you need to think about this Christmas season. You need to think about the good work around you. 
It's easy this Christmas season to be so weary and look at all the bad in the world, but look at God's good work, the good work that's around you. Uh, Mary, Mary says, um, uh, all generations will call me blessed. You, you see the work around you. Secondly, uh, look at God's work in you. Some of you have forgotten that God is at work in you. Some of you have forgotten that he's the God who likes to show up in unlikely places and unexpected times and shower some favor on his unexpected children. He is at work in you. Mary says, the mighty one has done great things for me. And she is not embarrassed to say, God's at work on my behalf. Third, ponder God's work still to happen in the future. From generation to generation. It's what he's done and it's what he will do. Ponder that he's coming back next time not as a baby, but next time as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then finally, ponder God's work in everybody else. You see, I like to think about God's work in me. Mary's like, no, no, no. God's been at work in everybody else too. His mercy is available to all who fear him. I don't know about you, but I want my heavenly dad to show up in an unlikely place at an unexpected time when I'm least expecting it and shower me with his favor. Anybody else? Here's how it happens. Isaiah 66, 2. These are the ones I look on with favor those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Do you not think that when my daughter called and said, I know you can't come and I don't expect you to be here, do you not think I wanted to be there even more? And when you come with a humble and contrite spirit, and God, I know I don't deserve it and I know I can't earn it and there's no way, God, that I can expect that you can do it. I think God says that's the kind of spirit I'm looking for and I'm going to show up in an unexpected place at an unlikely time and in your unsuspecting world and I'm going to shower you with my favor. My friend, are you humble and contrite in spirit? Do you have a response to God's word like Zachariah? And uh, aren't you glad sometimes that God doesn't work today like he did in the scriptures? Aren't you glad that you haven't had the same experience Zachariah did? When you doubted God's word, you couldn't talk for nine months? Aren't you glad that happened to him and not you? Okay, maybe it's just me. I'm glad that when I doubted God's word, he didn't make me silent for nine months. We don't want him to treat us like that. But are you more like Zechariah and you're silent and you doubt his word? Or are you more like Mary? I am your servant. May it be done to me according to her. God, that's all I can say. I'm your servant. Do whatever you want to do. My friend, are you humble and contrite? What's your song? Maybe your song needs to start like Mary's. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. But if you can't say he's your Savior, that's where you need to start today. If you cannot say, I have put my faith and trust in Jesus, I believe he was born of a virgin. He lived a life of perfection. He died a death on a cross and three days later rose from the dead. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Forgive my sins. The scriptures say that God demonstrated his love for you in this, that while you were still a sinner, Christ Jesus died for you. The scriptures say that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He can be your Savior today. Would you ask him if you've never done that before? And if you've asked him that, my friend who's following Jesus, if you're here today and you're deeply rewarded and highly disappointed, do not give up. Your heavenly Father is going to show up when you least expect it, where you don't expect it, and he's going to shower you with his favor if you'll humble yourself in front of him and tremble at his word. Almighty God, thank you for the power of this story. Thank you for the example of Zechariah and Elizabeth who were so deeply devoted and yet life didn't turn out like they wanted but they didn't stop serving you. And thank you that you showed up in an unlikely place in an unexpected time and dropped your favor on an unsuspecting couple. God, do that again. God, thank you for Mary who was highly frazzled but knew of your favor and said, okay, I'll just be your servant. Do for me according to your word. God, there are some of us on the front end and we've made plans and we've made I have expectations, and we just know that if they don't work out that way, uh, we'll be disappointed. But God, I already know that you're starting to disrupt our plans so that your plan can come true. Father, we simply come in front of you as those who will be humble and contrite. We tremble at your word. Father, for the one today who's never accepted Jesus as their Savior, may they simply pray a prayer like this, Lord Jesus, come into my life and forgive my sin. I confess my sins and I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you were born to die and rise from the dead. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. Friend, if you prayed a prayer like that on the back of your response card, you can check I accepted Jesus as my Savior today. You can put that in one of the red bowls where there'll be some people at those doors that would love to have a conversation with you about the decision you just made. But maybe, just maybe, 
you were a follower of Jesus and you prayed a prayer like that a long time ago. And truth be told, today, you've been highly devoted, but you're deeply disappointed. Would you simply say, Lord Jesus, come at an unexpected time in an unlikely place. Shower me with your favor. God, may your favor rest on my brothers and sisters as they follow hard after Jesus. Father, for the one that's deeply devoted yet highly disappointed, do what only you can do. For the one who says, okay, I'm favored, but they're still frazzled, may they hear you speak clearly and may they simply pray the prayer, I will be your servant today. And Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us, for coming for us. And Heavenly Dad, we ask that you just show up, shower us with your faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Friends, I love you. There are people around to have conversations with you. If you're a guest, don't forget to meet Sarah over here for the party. God loves you. I love you. We'll see you next week.